the Masters Endurance Legends race. Well, we're not going to be running into the darkness here at Silverstone, but we are certainly capturing the spirit of Le Mans that this year celebrated its centenary. 100 years since the first 24 hours at Le Mans. On pole position, fittingly enough, it's a French chassis, the Pescarolo of Tim and Herinda de Silva from the Kennard Constable Acura with Steve Brooks Peugeot and the Lola Aston Martin, the gorgeous V12 car of Christoph Danzenborg in those golf colours lining up on row two of the grid. Morgan Pescarolos, Delaras, Zytex, Oricas, BR01s, more Peugeots, Mike Newton's MG Lola, the EX268 with its AER motor, HPD Hondas, and then the LMP3 battle. That's going to be really interesting as well because those are pretty much still absolutely current cars, the Ligiers and the Norma. The Norma was the dominant force up really until the 2022 season when the Ligier GSP3 really started to take over. And the Reynard Protran, that car, the first hybrid car to run at Le Mans, the Morgan Aero Super Sport, and car that I've never seen or heard of before, the Nissan Jade, little black device. So there goes the Red Bull Ferrari, and behind it, the Morgan Aero Super Sport, and there is the Jade Nissan. Uh, looks very much like uh, an SN2 or an SN3 car, so sort of sub LMP3 category, but uh, with the uh, similar engine to the early LMP2, uh, LMP3 cars the uh, Nissan engines that powered them in their first iteration before the uh, Gibson power units took over. So all sorts of different sights and sounds, different cars in different classes, and that is very much the spirit of Le Mans. This race is all about prototypes predominantly. They will be the force at the front of the field. And as ever, the fast expanses of Silverstone will be a reasonable training ground uh, or has always been a reasonable training ground as you develop your car for Le Mans. This was the Silverstone six hours, a thousand kilometers, was traditionally the European season opener for endurance racing. Then you'd have the six hours, a thousand k's of Spa, and that would be the final warm up for Le Mans. So you'd shake the car down here at Silverstone, make sure everything ran. Spa is where you would introduce your low downforce aero package because that worked well at Spa, and that's what you would need at Le Mans. And then you'd go to Le Mans and find out that everything worked and it was glorious or nothing worked at all and it was horrendous and uh, for most people who go to Le Mans most years you don't come away with much other than uh, the desire to go back and do it again so cars heading out from the pit lane and uh, sweeping around we'll try and uh, pick some bones out of this let's take a look at a few of them as they go by the bright red number 24 Courage LC75 so this is a LMP2 car built by Courage Eve Courage's company uh, back in 2007 and the Courage firm based at Le Mans in the techno park there as Orica is as well Orica has a big base at Le Mans also has a big base also a manicure but Hugo Schoenach's uh, spiritual home really I guess is Le Mans so Eve Courage the only man to win Le Mans in a car bearing his own name. So Jack Brabham is the only man to win the Formula One World Championship in a car bearing his own name, and Yves Courage the same at Le Mans. So that was uh, back in the uh, dawn of the 80s. And the car on pole position in the Gulf livery, the open Gulf car, that is the Pescarola LMP2 chassis of Tim and Herinda de Silva. Jonathan Kennard starts the Acura alongside. Again, you heard from Jonathan, an LMP2 car. It's going to lose out in a straight line to the LMP1s, but in the tight and twisty stuff, it should be at least their match. Steve Brooks will start third in the Peugeot 90X. That's the blue and black uh, diesel uh, Peugeot. The LMP1 car and Christoph Dansenborg in 007, the Gulf livery closed Aston Martin engine Lola. Fabulous looking car, a stunning sounding car. You'll hear it before you see it. Um, not in the way that you used to hear the Mazda 787 before you even arrived in the country, but uh, you will certainly hear the sound. If you're trackside, this is going to be a, a If you've never been to Le Mans, then we're, we're bringing Le Mans to you. The, OK, not this year's Le Mans cars, not the hyper cars, but cars that would have raced there this century and uh, in a certain number of cases, uh, quite recently this century as well. The Peugeot's racing there in 2011. 
and so they've got uh, some very good Le Mans vintage here. So some, some great sights and sounds, LMP1 cars, LMP2 cars, LMP3 cars, which is sort of uh, second half of the uh, last two decades, invention below LMP2 to train drivers and teams and to bring them through. And uh, there you can see as well the uh, Lola Mazda from the IMSA uh, Championship, a very uh, competitive car. We've got a couple of uh, HPD Hondas, Acura Hondas as well, which will have raced in the IMSA series in the early part of the 21st century. So those are equivalent LMP2 cars. And this final formation lap could be important for these drivers to build the heat in the brakes, build the heat in the tyres. No tyre warmers before they leave the pit lane. And uh, as you saw Ed saying, all right, well, they, they won't use the ratty old tyres that they use for transport, but they certainly won't have heat in the tyres when they left the pit lane. That's going to be very important and whoever gets the heat in best, and I'm looking here predominantly, I think, at the LMP2 drivers, are likely to fare very well in the opening laps. Now, it's all, not all just about prototypes, as you can see further down the order. There you go, black and white Aston Martin. We've got a couple of Astons, Mercedes, Ferraris in the field as well, and the uh, Morgan Aero and an Audi R8, which had a little bit of a problem. And right towards the tail of the field, another car with which Martin Short was associated over the years, the Mosler MT900R, that's the white and blue car towards the tail of the field. So we've got those as well. And that means as the race progresses, as at Le Mans, you will get into traffic with much slower cars. And that's where the prototype drivers really earn their money, trying to find those gaps. Lights out on the safety car as we exit tyre exit timing sector two at the end of the hangar straight just before we get into the stow. We are getting ready to go with this glorious assortment of sports racers and prototypes and GTs from the last two decades. Safety car pulls into the pits. Drivers will form up in two by two formation. We get ready to race at Silverstone. The Masters racing legends ready to be released around the expanses of the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. The blue and orange of Harinda Her da Silva from pole position leads the field into the first corner. Jonathan Kennard alongside him in the Acura slots into second. And then Steve Brooks in the closed cockpit Peugeot 90X, the diesel FAP car in third position. Right behind him, the glorious normally aspirated V12 Aston Martin engine in the Gulf livery Lola Aston of Christoph Dansenborg. Just a taste of the sights and sounds of Le Mans, which celebrates its centenary this year. We're not racing through the night. It's 40 minutes, not 24 hours. And that means, like Steve Brooks, as he moves up into second ahead of Jonathan Kennard, you have got to get on with this. And Alistair Douglas, that's going to put a real premium on making passes in these cars that were built not for 40 minutes, but for nearly 40 hours of survival. Yes, and uh, the first opportunity for them to even half stretch their legs was the Wellington straight there, where Steve Brooks nipped through into second, uh, and they'll get another good opportunity through the Beckett S's, which, as you said yesterday, not unlike the Porsche curves at Le Mans, and then onto the hangar straight, where they'll really be able to open these cars up, and we will keep an eye on the top speeds uh, and let you know what sort of speeds they're doing on the hangar straight as they come through Beckett's. It's still Harindra to Silver leading. Steve, uh, sorry, Steve Brooks coming up into second momentarily there, but uh, Jonathan Kennard in the Acura getting back into second as they come onto the hangar straight for the first time. And this is where the Peugeot should whistle by. You saw the diesel turbo whizzing up into the Beckett's S is behind Herinda de Silva. Didn't quite find the gap I thought he was looking for, so he decided that discretion was the better part of Allah. As soon as he got onto the hangar straight, straight by Jonathan Kennard's Acura. Now he has his nose cut off a little bit by the Pescarolo. 
Pescarolo run by Henri Pescarolo's eponymous team from its workshops in Le Mans, built by them for the LMP2 races. But the Peugeot with the power on the straight to go straight by. So Steve Brooks takes the lead. Jonathan Kennard looking down the inside in the Acura. In the Acura through he goes into second place. Herinda de Silva in third. And the Lola Aston Martin of Christoph Dansenborg behind us. There's a big lockup tailing them in. And was that the Cummings and Ellis uh, Morgan Pescarella? I think it might have been. So there are the top four. Who is in fifth place? Well, there is the Pescarello just ahead of the X Markets car, the X Martin short machine in sixth position. And Gregor Fiskin starting the Delara that he shares with Sam Hancock. Sam Hancock having a seat fitting yesterday to try and wedge him into the car. But Steve Brooks whistling away in the first of the two Peugeots because there are a pair of 90Xs in the field. Peugeot have sold on almost all of their factory cars. They've retained only the outright Le Mans winner. And one of the three drivers who won Le Mans for Peugeot in these cars, David Brabham, is here as well on the kidney research stand with the Brabham simulator. So you can go and chat Le Mans to him and try and help raise some money for kidney disease as well. And Jonathan Kennard latching onto the tail of Steve Brooks. Again, it's really when Brooks starts to come on the cam and that engine really starts to pull hard down the straight that Kennard is left trailing in his wake a little. But as we heard from the LMP2 drivers, once you get into the twisty stuff, that's where the uh, battle becomes a little more even. Yes, and that's uh, one of the areas that's a little bit twisty is through Club Corner, and you can see already Jonathan Kennard has closed up a little bit, and they go up now the Hamilton Straight into the right and left at Abbey and Farm, and then it gets really twisty in uh, what's been uh, called the arena section of the track, which is Village and the Loop, and up the inside comes Jonathan Kennard, perfectly predicted by Martin Haven there, get into the twiddly bits, and uh, Jonathan Kennard's car comes into its own. So he takes the lead from Steve Brooks through Aintree now, and then on to the uh, Wellington Strait, only fractionally sn slower than the Hangar Strait. So will Steve Brooks come back through? Yeah, look at Kennard. He's having long, long looks, looks in the mirror. He knows he's going to come. He knows that Peugeot's got the speed. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Uh, Jonathan's got plenty of experience in uh, decent single-seaters and sports car racing. So he knows the potential of that Peugeot right behind. And he wants to try and escape if he can before the mid-race where they'll hand over to Jamie Constable. Steve Brooks will stay in that Peugeot. Harinda De Silva starting the number 10 Pescarolo from pole. He'll hand over to son Tim De Silva. Christoph Danzenberg hogging all the driving of the Lola Aston to himself. I mean, why would you share it if you didn't have to? But, uh, a great opportunity for Jonathan Kennard to try and keep his nose in front. And we're breaking up into two two-car battles. Kennard versus Brooks for the lead. And De Silva and Danzenberg for third position. They come out of the chapel curve now, and the two Gulf livery cars, third and fourth, and behind them is the uh, Peugeot looks down the inside. Behind them is the second 90X, and that is car number six of Stuart Wiltshire. So Stuart started in ninth place. He's now up to fifth. So again, like Steve Brooks, possibly took a corner or two just to find a clear bit of road, and then got the hammer down coming up to uh, Abbey and Farm. And uh, behind the battle for third place now with Christoph Danzenborg going up the inside and gets past Harindra de Silva going into Abbey. And uh, also coming up behind, is that the second of the Persians? Yes, it I is. I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, yes. that's Stuart Wiltshire, yep. car so, number six. So after a, a relatively slower start, he's made his way through, but they're all boxed up now behind a, a much slower car. Yeah, that's the Courage. The courage yeah, yeah, that had a problem earlier on, and that's now gone a lap down. It's not the only car, actually. Uh, that has had a, a little early problem. You can see the Vitaphone Aston Martin in front, and that turquoise or green and black car, that will be gobbled up fairly quickly as well. Luckily, uh, Gunter Alt is on his own in that Aston Martin GT3 car, so the leaders will get by him fairly quickly, but there are some good battles in front of them that are going to pose much more of a problem. And that's exactly what you find at Le Mans. It's one of the toughest jobs getting by the back marker traffic. 17, that is Anton Dantenberg in his uh, Delara Orica. So 
And that is, uh, again, an LMP1 car. And there's trouble for one of our P3 entries. That's the Kells car. Now, has that had a suspension collapse of the rear? That rear wheel looked very close to the bodywork, and I'm uh, a little surprised it was quite so close. And Steve Brooks going for the lead again into Stoke Corner. Jonathan Kennard, though, managing to hold him off, takes the line. And in fact, Steve Brooks in that little effort there, he ran a little wide at Stowe, but uh, back onto the power again as they come up into Club Corner and uh, through the right-hander to complete another lap. Now, again, one of the things that the 90X has got is a low drag, but also relatively do low downforce setup. And they will be running that on maximum downforce, which is still at a low level. Now, the LMP2 cars, much more variable, so they will have a, a probably a better grip and downforce set up here for Silverstone. Although it's a quick circuit, it is a medium downforce circuit. Much more downforce required here than at Spa or Le Mans. Down the inside comes Wiltshire, grabs third from Dunsenborg. Dunsenborg had got ahead of Harinda de Silva as well. So the two Gulf cars that started, what, first and fourth are now fourth and fifth. So the Peugeot's up to second and third, but look at the Lola Aston now. Because of the normal, normally aspirated car, if he's got it in the power band, the Aston will pick up speed even quicker than the diesel Peugeot initially, but uh, then the Peugeot starts to stretch its legs away a little. And that works. Lola Aston V12 is the engine out of the uh, Aston Martin Vantage uh, in the back of the uh, Lola chassis. And for one glorious year, those cars wailed around Le Mans, looking and sounding absolutely fabulous. Same golf livery on the Pescarolo, right behind of Harinda de Silva. And again, he's losing very little at all to Christoph Dansenborg. Christoph, such an experienced historic racer now, which actually isn't to say that Harinda isn't. Harinda and Tim de Silva have done plenty of historic racing. Christoph Dansenborg started out in FIA GTs when he was a, a younger driver. So he's been racing in endurance racing almost all his career. But the number six Peugeot now starting to stretch away. Traffic in front of him in the form of the Morgan Aero Supersport. And again, slower cars. And that was all part of the picture here at Silverstone in this shortened version of an endurance race. And Morgan also racing at Le Mans in the uh, early part of the 20th century, not with the aero. And this classic battle, Porsche 911 versus Mosler MT900. Another strong connection with Martin Short, the, uh, the Mosler, he was the uh... UK importer of the Mosler and uh, Michael and Sean McInerney. It is at the wheel of the Signia sponsored car. That shorty, I think, has only just sold his last Mosler, and uh, his son Morgan was out in it a little earlier in the season. The two sons actually have been out in yep. the car and won uh, club races in the car. Good to see that car back out. And again, the Mosler has a great sound because it's a, Cor a Corvette V8 in the back of it. So lots of LMP2, LMP3 battles. The car in the background with the pink of Jacques Nicolet. And now the pink is, uh, is a rugby and Toulouse-based colour reference, but Jacques Nicolet, uh, the man who bought Pescarolo uh, when the factory closure happened, and then having sealed the bid, publicly handed the keys to the factory straight back to Henri Pescarola, who was absolutely gobsmacked. So heartbroken that his team was being sold, he was there. Nicolet bought it and then literally handed him the keys to the building and said, there you go, off you go. Then he took over building Pescarolos under the Onroke name of his own company. And uh, you can see uh, Onroke built Morgans as well, which were LMP2 chassis, not related to Morgan in the Mulvans uh, in the race as well. Now, Red 5, familiar with uh, many, many Grand Prix fans as Nigel Mansell's number, and that's no uh, surprise because this Beach Dean sponsored car driven at Le Mans in period by Nigel Mansell with his two sons, Greg and Leo. They raced here in the Silverstone 1000Ks as well, competed in the Le Mans series uh, up to Le Mans. 
unfortunately the race came to a bit of a shuddering halt. Uh, Arnage having a crash early on in some fairly appalling weather conditions and uh, the boys not getting a chance to race it. Keith Reeser running that uh, red five got through past Christoph Donselberg in the uh, Lola Aston and uh, now Donselberg coming off on the inside at Brooklands. This may end in the Aston going ahead. Yes, it does. Not always certain when you uh, overtake at Brooklands because coming up next is Luffield, which is a right-hander, but uh, Donselberg made his way through. So uh, Keith Reeser took the place and lost it again in the space of a couple of corners. But that's a good battle because uh, in behind is Harindra De Silva in the pole sitting car. So uh, that's a battle for fifth place. Yeah, red five in Fourth fifth. fifth. That is a Zytec chassis. And again, as we saw with the LMP1, LMP2 battle earlier with the Peugeot and uh, with Jonathan Kennard, it's the nimbleness of the P2 chassis and the fact that it can carry more aero or does carry more aero because they weren't just designed to win at Le Mans like the Peugeot was. Persia was really a compromise everywhere apart from the Circuit de la Sarte. And there you can see Harinda de Silva under real pressure uh, from the other Dalsenborg entry. And that is the Lister sponsored Delara Orica. So Antoine Dalsenborg starting that one. Uh, driving solo, we're told. Okay. In that one. Werner Dansberg also on the entry list. We'll wait and see. But again, that car plied most of its trade in North America. And right behind, car number 36, the red and blue of SMP Racing. And that car driven by Max Lynn, the BR01, their own name on the chassis, the chassis designed by Delara. So Max Lynn in eighth place, a three-car battle here. The LMP2 cars, the Golf livery Delara. The Lister behind it. And then the SMP BR01 trying to close in. They make their way past the Ferrari. And that's the uh, GT3458 of Colin Sota. And that car, about the same period as these cars. Race in 2011, a big looping spin for Antoine Dansenburg in the Delara Orica. Now, I've just realised, actually, that that's not a Didier Tay-style helmet. That looks much more Ricardo Patrese, doesn't it? Antoine Danseberg. So he's uh, donutted his, his way round back into the right direction. And uh, Frieza has moved back ahead of Christoph Danseberg. So, again, the red five starting to move its way up the order. The Zytec now up to fourth position. So we've got Jonathan Kennard still leading and now by four seconds over Steve Brooks. Brooks in second place as you see the AMG Mercedes. Now here is a battle that you could probably see played out next week in the Michelin Le Mans Cup GT3 versus LMP3. Now normally the LMP3 cars are way ahead but quite often the, uh, the tail enders in the LMP3 field find that the GT3 cars that start behind them or amongst them are the devil's own job to get past. This is Wayne Mars in a 2017 AMG GT3. And just behind him, car number 52, Ron Maiden, who uh, shares with Craig Davis, who started that one. Uh, I think it was Craig Davis, yes it is. Now into the pit lane, as the pit window is open, comes Harinda De Silva. <laughs> expected because uh, Tim, his son, is a little quicker than Harindra and uh, set the pole time in that car. And uh, the pit window is uh, the uh, just 10 minutes, so not very long, 10 minutes. And uh, if I gave you all the cars that had got additional time penalties for elite drivers, as we see Wayne Mars having a big spin in his GT3 Mercedes, uh, it would take me the rest of the race. So uh, we'll, I'll, I'll tell you if you ask me, Martin. I won't ask. How, how long will they have to stop for? Because it is relevant. The lead yeah. car has a longer stop than the Brooks car in second place. We'll just sort it out. Christopher Milner and Nigel Greens. Of course, Nigel Greens was driving that car in the Lola Mazda, in the Lola B1260. It's uh, an MP1 car. There's Mike Newton in the car that he raced in period, the car, the MG Lola AER run by RML and Phil Barker and his crew still running that car. And Mike Newton still enjoying driving it. 
So there is the Aston Martin that was the lead GT car in the race. And Mike Newton looking to slice down the inside, telegraph that early, but the Aston driver didn't oblige. Now running off track is our race leader, Jonathan Kennard. He's parked it. So Kennard out of the race, which leaves a Peugeot 1-2. Now, this is where they detonate their pistons because they changed the spec of the cars before the race. At least that's what happened in period. But uh, Steve Brooks takes the lead. And in second place, Stuart Wiltshire in car number six. So there is your new race leader. The Cez and the Cease, the two Peugeots, 16 in front of six. So Steve Brooks, the new race leader, didn't seem to be smoke from Jonathan Kennard's car, but clearly Either he felt or heard something, or it lit up like a Christmas tree. He has parked the car down before they get to the loop. Steve Brooks has just gone by him, and Stuart Wiltshire will do the same. So up into third place has gone Red 5. So that's good progress for Keith Freezer from eighth on the grid. Of Dantenburg up to fourth place, but it is Peugeot 1 2. Neither of these two Peugeot will have to swap drivers, and there's trouble. Now, that uh, Audi, I'm afraid, the R8 LMS Ultra was quite recalcitrant in qualifying yesterday, it didn't really want to behave itself at all, and uh, seems to be equally um, unconvinced by the need to keep going even for 40 minutes. Uh, it is a GT3 Audi, but uh, doesn't really seem to be very keen on running. Into the pit lane then comes the race leader. There is another Audi in the race, a Le Mans prototype LMP1 Audi R8, one of the original cars, silver with yellow highlights. At least he qualified yesterday in the hands of Nick Halusa. Did it start the race? I don't see it on the grid, actually, so um, that may have had an issue. But the leader is in the pits. Door open for Steve Brooks. And although the car looks like it's got quite a decent-sized cockpit, the car itself is tiny, and so is the cockpit. This car driven in period, as you can see from the window, by, among others, Fontaine and Stefan Sarrazin. Both of whom are still current race drivers. I'm trying to remember who the third driver was, and the can't. It have been an all-French lineup. And meanwhile, here is the battle for what might become the lead if they stay out. Stuart Wiltshire. Is Tim De Silva. So Tim has stopped and is now harassing the number six Peugeot that has not stopped. So that puts them, I think, exactly one lap apart, doesn't yes. it? Uh, with A lap and of... inches. Yes, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So uh, when the. Oh, and here he goes. Look, he's going to try and unlap himself before the Peugeot stops. The Peugeot just slightly held up there out of cops. Oh, is brave stuff. Tim De Silva left himself with no option but to complete the move, and oh, blimey, O'Reilly, I think Stuart Wiltshire was very surprised. Yellow flags on the exit for the Audi. I wonder whether that... Oh, is it going to move again? It has moved again. Well, hopefully they'll make it to the pit lane without the need for a safety car. So that could be a very telling move for... Tim De Silva unlapping himself from the race leader before the race leader stops. Now, these guys are lapping in 148, 149s. I think the Peugeot is going to have to spend longer than that in the pit lane. It's going to be interesting to see where Steve Brooks comes out in the number 16 Peugeot. As in comes the car that is second on the road, the Red 5 Zytec, the Mansell family car. successful partnership in that car with Tommy Erdos, the Brazilian driver, and Mike now running that car on his own and thoroughly enjoying it. I think he's got two or three varieties of that chassis in his own uh, colours that they raced over the years. There's a couple of Ligier LMP3 cars heading towards the camera. 
And I noticed that Christoph Donselberg was going down the pit lane behind that recalcitrant Audi. I hope it wasn't running at uh, a very low speed as it was out on track. I think it probably was running at yeah. a very low speed. Because that would have uh, lost Donselberg some time in the pit lane. He's allowed to do 60 kilometres an hour. That's a 60 second minimum stop time for most cars. Certainly the ones in the leading group all uh, are penalty free in terms of the uh, elite driver penalties. The race leader is still car number six, Stuart Wiltshire, or has been for the last couple of laps. Stuart Wiltshire, he now comes in. And I'm assuming, assuming that the same team was running both Peugeots, or is running both Peugeots, so you want to try and stagger the stops as much as you can. stories about the Peugeot team the year before they claimed victory Le Mans with David Brown and his teammates they had looked to be very much the dominant force they absolutely wiped the floor without it qualifying the car was very very quick but they had made changes to the engine in the lead into Le Mans and uh, in the early morning hours on Sunday one after another within with very quick succession uh, the factory Peugeots and the Uga Shonak Orica run Peugeot all uh, burned pistons out and uh, exploded in a cloud of exhaust smoke um, and were at the side of the road. Then the crew gathered together in the build-up to the beginning of the following season and there's a nice little bit of documentary footage. They all went uh, to the team bosses or the, the uh, engineering chief's house and they watched Audi's Truth in 24 um, documentary and at the end of it there's a couple of comments and uh, the guys are saying yeah it looks like a lot more fun when you win and it was that sort of penny dropping moment that, that really drove them on and then the car had the uh, the speed and the consistency to win it now trouble for the 26 car I think this is a car that Jacques Nicolet possibly raced in period as well as carrying his colors Dean Ford and Jamie Thwaites with the on -roke. Morgan Pescarolo, his car from 2013, so just 10 years old. And here is the second place car in the GT battle. And there is the MG Mercedes. And again, the uh, Vigier GSP3 right behind. A battle between GT3 and LMP3. And for the first time next year at Le Mans, GT3 cars will be the GT category. So next year's Le Mans 24 hours will have just two categories, hypercar and GT3. LMP2, uh, it seems, will not be racing at Le Mans in 2024 as we head towards the 100th running of the race, not the 100th anniversary of the first race, which was this year, but in another eight years' time, we will have the actual 100th race. This, of course, World War II, and uh, at one stage, strikes and fuel crisis have uh, delayed or cancelled Le Mans. So we're eight years away from the 100th Le Mans 24 hours. What that will bring again in terms of celebration, I think uh, you might want to try booking your tickets now. Well, the Audi is still going sort of in its own fashion, but uh, not really doing much in terms of convincing pace. And here comes Tim De Silva. Steve Brooks remains out front after his pit stop in the number 16 Peugeot. We're going to have to wait for our timing screens to realign themselves because. We need to know how far Tim De Silva is behind. He's ahead of Stuart Wiltshire. We thought that was going to happen when he unlapped himself before Wiltshire's pit stop. So Tim De Silva in second place, 23.9 seconds back now from Steve Brooks in the Peugeot 90X. Another year of uh, running and driving the car. Steve Brooks, that car didn't really quite live up to its pre-race billing last year, but it certainly has had a, a much better run through this year. And this car, Harinder and Tim De Silva, going very well. The Riley and Scott, Mark III there, the black open car kicking up the dirt. And that is coming up through the order as well. It's got a, a good run going. That car didn't qualify as strongly, maybe, as you might have thought. 
Xavier Michelot in the uh, six-litre Riley and Scott. I think that does have the Caddy Mall Star V8 in it. And here is Steve Brooks carving his way through traffic. He's really settled down into the car superbly now, hasn't he? Into the final third of the race, working his way through traffic. He's got the tyres and the brakes where he wants them. And the car just swooping around Silverstone effortlessly. Among all the other engine noises, it's going to be hard to hear the Peugeot, the uh, muted turbo diesel whistle of the car, the same with the Audi R10s. Make them like low-flying jets often, particularly in the quicker sections at Le Mans, all you'd hear was the, the turbulence in the air rather than any engine note. So set that against the... Uh... 12-cylinder whale of the Aston Martin, and uh, it's rather uninspiring, the <laughs> diesel whistle. And, yeah. uh, ha having been at them, I know you go, go to Lemoy every year, but I haven't been that often, and I was there the year of the Peugeots, and just uh, standing at Mulsan listening to them coming. Well, not listening to them. Oh, there's a Peugeot here. Yeah. Exactly, when, when, when you're at the Porsche curves as well, up against the wall and you're only about eight feet away from the track and the thing comes through near silently, yes. it is, it probably is whispering death. I mean, they're, they're, they're absolutely, I mean, especially the Porsche curves, a modern LMP car just hugs the road like it's a turbocharged Hoover. And uh, yeah, you don't hear it coming. It's just like there's a, a fighter jet coming past you. Well, there is Red 5. Still in sight, perhaps, of the podium. Stuart Wiltshire, the Peugeot, he can see now, he's got visual, so the gap is not that big. There's the Peugeot, and there is the Zytec behind. Now, in terms of time, that was four seconds. Wiltshire was a little quicker on his best lap, but Freezer is quicker at the moment, not by a lot. And maybe not by enough, but enough to give Stuart Wiltshire plenty to think about. Now, modern cars like these would, in period, have had very good ship-to-shore radio. I'm not sure whether the teams still do or not. But every lap when he sees the gap, the plus over fourth, is going to get smaller and smaller. It's the last lap times, sir. Uh just slightly in favour of Keith Reeser. There's not a lot in it. No. So uh, he is, as you say, easing up as they come down, or he comes down into Stowe Corner. And we should get a flash uh, on the shot as they go perhaps along the Hamilton Strait of the Peugeot that he's chasing. And we'll also get our exact gap between the two. It was 4.1. Let's see, is he making up time? It is 6.3. So in fact, Keith Reeser is on that lap anyway, lost two seconds. Now, so that's unusual, I'm not sure why. Somebody had had a big lock up there um, in front of the pits, not sure who left a big cloud of smoke. Freezer trying to carve his way past this Ferrari and does so. Fastest race lap, by the way, 144.05, set by, I'm assuming, Tim De Silva rather than Harinda De Silva in the number 10 Pescarolo, the open golf coloured car. Um, best lap of either of the Peugeots, a 147.9, so 3.9 seconds slower, Steve Brooks, than the best lap of this car, car number 10. So now he may have been keeping closer to that, but actually the race lap for the number 10 car is quicker than they went in qualifying. It is, uh, and uh, traffic willing, and that's why he's being so relatively aggressive. Tim De Silva, a quick driver, but also quite an aggressive driver, and he's forcing his way through the traffic. He needs to. There's eight minutes and 50 seconds to go. So Hancock in the X markets, Delara, just being passed by De Silva. Mike Newton next up. So Hancock in the Delara with uh, a battle with the LMP2 car of Mike Newton. And there is the Peugeot of Steve Brooks. No, I beg your pardon, yes, it is Steve Brooks. Get my sixes and my sixteens mixed up. Stuart Wiltshire in car number six, still in third. 
Martins Frieza 6.3 seconds back. So the gap opens and closes as they meet traffic that either falls nicely for them or not. And it didn't fall nicely for Tim De Silva on the last lap. He lost two seconds to the leader, having been uh, at least two seconds a lap quicker on the previous lap. So uh, just caught that uh, big bunch of traffic. And I think that's going to be the story of the, uh, the remaining eight minutes of the race because there are so many cars out on track. There aren't many straights and corners where he gets a clear run. And you think perhaps that the Peugeot would suffer a little bit more from that, but traffic, it's, it's either break for you or break against you, and there's, there's no happy medium. It does look like the Peugeot has had slightly better brakes than the traffic again. Another LMP3 battle coming towards us with some P2 cars behind. There is Tim De Silva. He's got Mike Newton uh, clinging on to his coattails behind. Mike Newton in 14th place overall and leading his class. Group 1, P2. And Tim De Silva making his way through the Beckett S's. He's got the Courage, is that uh, just ahead? Uh, I think it was. No, it wasn't. It was the Dallara. Uh, similar colours. Uh, down the hangar straight, he's got an LMP3 car just ahead of him. He gets through on the inside of that and will shortly get the next lap time comparison with seven minutes remaining in this race. Now that Ligier he passed was John Minshaw's LMP3 Ligier 133. That car is actually in 11th place. So the leaders have lapped everybody bar the top 10. So John Minshaw, not sure how much experience John's got in an LMP3 car. Certainly. Uh, hasn't raced them uh, as, a, as a current race car, if you like. Uh, but uh, top 10 position at the moment for him. And the gap first to second once again went out a little, so uh, I think it's a combination of uh, just the traffic falling perhaps badly for Tim, but uh, I think Steve Brooks has got the message, whether they've got radio or not, uh, he's got the message that he needs to press on, and his last few lap times have been very competitive. I think probably when you're in a car like this, it actually begs you to press on because it feels more comfortable when it's doing what it's supposed to do, when it's up on its toes, being really driven into its aero window. And that's whether you're in a, a GT car, a P3, a P2 or a P1, when it's doing what it was designed to do, that's when it feels least like it's going to turn around and bite you, I think. So again, for Tim De Silva here, Tim's absolutely flying. Uh, I mean, for an LMP2 car like that, or for a, an older Pescara like that, to be matching uh, a factory-built diesel prototype like that car, uh, that's uh, a remarkable pace. So the uh, Pescara was a P1 car, as was the Loder Aston. Christoph Dansenborg in 007, still in fifth place. So if you ask the organisers nicely, there's, there's no absolute reason whatsoever why anybody in the ACO would need to let you be anything other than car number seven. But because it's Aston Martin and it's James Bond association, which they get, yes, you can have 007. Might possibly have cost a little bit more than the standard entry, but, you know, there you go. Got two more zeros to print in the programme. <laughs> there you go, so we put two more zeros on, on the, the cost yes. of your engine. I, <laughs> oh, I think it's fair. possibly not that much more. <laughs> uh, so is this Mike Newton under pressure here? Uh, no, the, uh, yes, it is. Um, so the car right behind, 41, Rob Hall's Ligier. Mike Newton is in a battle for position with that car for 12th place. Now that uh, he is just being passed by the Lister livery car, number 17 of Antoine Dansenburg at uh, IMSA Delara Orica. And so Antoine Dansenburg now up to 11th, chasing down Sam Hancock in the X Markets Delara, the green and blue car just in front. And then the next car is Mike Newton, the red, white and blue um, view car. And then behind him, the black car is the next car in the queue as well. So that is the battle for the top 10. And here is Christoph Dansenborg halfway up the top 10 ladder in the 007 Lola Aston. Again, uh, a good sounding and, and pretty competitive program, despite the fact it was up against the diesel turbos, uh, the 007 Lola Aston. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Lola and Aston Martin slightly fell over 
and fell out about, about who built and designed the car and whether it should be called a Lola or just an Aston Martin. Aston Martin kept insisting it was an Aston Martin, even though the chassis was built in Huntingdon at Lola's factory. And so it sort of fell over that deal. And then Aston Martin decided to design their own car, which was an unmitigated failure of catastrophic proportions, barely turned a lap in practice, and uh, it was an embarrassment to the firm and to everybody involved with it. And uh, I'm not sure we'll ever see that car racing in historic racing of any kind, shape or form. Very much an unloved child. Christoph Dantable carving through traffic into the Beckett's S's as we get into inside the final three minutes of the race. Another car closing up, Bradley Ellis has taken over the number 28, uh, Morgan Pescarolo, and uh, he is closing in, whether he's got time to take the place, but that's for uh, car number 28 catching car number 36 in sixth and seventh places, Max Lynn in the 36 car ahead, uh, which is the BR01, which we yeah. saw earlier on. That's the chrome, red, white and blue livery car. Uh, very distinctive livery, livery, all chrome colours, the BR01, run by SMP Racing. That's a Russian team. It was indeed, yeah. And there it is, in fact. Well, that's another SMP Racing, that is the BR01. And here again, Tim De Silva still chasing, and he will chase until the chequered flag stops him chasing. Gap down under 12 seconds now. It was 13.5 at the beginning of the lap, 11.9 now. And Steve Brooks knows that he's got all the time in the world to make those moves in traffic without taking any risk. Finds his way past another of the uh, JSP3, LMP3 cars, or will do shortly. So that's the Maiden and Davis car forced around the outside and then chopped off as he gets into the loop. So uh, not a great uh, few corners. In fact, Steve Brooks almost having to come to a stop there. Uh, so slow was he through the loop, so he makes a very wide pass on that other car. But I think we'll see the gap will have come down, but with only a minute to go, uh, there's no real time for Tim De Silva to make a difference. No, the full length of the Wellington straight, unless... There is a mistake, and again, we've had this happen a couple of times. There's De Silva, there's the race leader. He only needs to trip over somebody, misjudge a gap, and have a half spin, and then De Silva will be all over him. And if Tim De Silva, with a with the tail up as he has now, gets by, then he may well be able to... Oh, Mike Newton with a big spin, so Newton loses 12th place. Now, no damage done. That looked like it was on the exit of the uh, new stadium section. Oh, and a spin for the 17 car as well. So that's Antoine Dossenbourg. Are they related? There's Mike Newton getting going again. I wonder if they were. Well, Christoph Dossenbourg happily in fifth place still. But uh, Newton and Antoine Dossenbourg both dropping down the order. Check and find the weights though. Time has run out as it always does, even in a 24 hour race. This is a 40-minute encounter here for the Masters Endurance Legends, and it will be victory to the Peugeot 90X of Steve Brooks. Tim De Silva will cross the line less than 10 seconds behind, 5.3 seconds in it, and in third place should be the second Peugeot of Stuart Wiltshire. You've just seen the BR01 come across the line in ninth place. And there is 007, Christoph Danzenborg under pressure in traffic, but here comes Stuart Wilshire, the second of the Peugeots, not making it a 1-2 for the French team. And he will come through. Behind him, the very low, wide Ryan Scott Mark III with the North Star Caddy V8s. There's Mike Newton after the spin. Behind him is uh, Keith Frieser in red five. Zytec that was raced at Le Mans in period by Nigel Mansell and the boys. And by the boys, I mean his two sons, Leo and Greg. And across
across the line. Keith Reeser in fifth place with Christoph Dansenborg behind him in the whaling V12 Lola Aston Martin. Here he is sweeping into the final turn and that will be a top five finish for the Lola Aston. Right on his heels. That's fifth, sixth, and seventh across the line, quicker than you can say it. Just hanging on there from the number 28 Morgan Pescarolo of Andy Cummings and Bradley Ellis, and ahead of the BRO1 of Max Lynn. So some really close racing, some very enterprising driving, a couple of very lurid looping spins, and our GT class winner is the car that was fastest in qualifying in GTs, the black and white Aston Martin. Silva really did uh, a lot of early groundwork. Steve Brooks taking his time to really find his feet in this Peugeot 90X. Not surprising, highly sophisticated, low drag, relatively do low downforce, plenty of torque, lots of grunt in the Peugeot 90X. It's a, a very individual driving sensation, I'm sure, whereas this, the uh, Pescarolo, probably a lot more of a traditional style race car. Uh, Tim and Herinda de Silva doing a sterling job in that to split the Peugeots with Stuart Wiltshire coming home in third place and Steve Brooks victorious in the Cez. Organising our GT top three as well. So Steve Brooks claims victory from Tim and Harindra to Silva with Stuart Wiltshire in third. And in our GT class, uh, the Aston Martin claiming first position. 160 in second place, Wayne Mars in the orange AMG GT3. Third of our GT cars. We're going to have to search a bit for that one. Actually, it was the GT GT2 car of the McInerneys ahead of the GT3 car, which was third in its class. Uh, and that was the uh, Colin Salter Ferrari car number 126. <laughs> Do you know what? I bet it gets your flipping attention. I really bet it does. I bet you feel. 10 years younger when you get out and 10 years older the next day. I don't think that's an easy car to drive in any way, shape or form. Um, probably never was in period and probably really isn't now either. And again, with so much other traffic, uh, there's a, a lot of work to do for the drivers of the quickest cars in these races. And not much time to do it either. You know, when these cars raced here in period, they would have six hours to sort out anything and stay at the front. Here you got 40 minutes. So what have they done? Uh, 21 laps. <laughs> There's uh, the father and son, Harindra and Tim De Silva. That was a, a great race that they put in as well. Put the car on pole. Uh, to the pole position time, I think that Tim set 145.07. Fastest race lap, 144.05. So, Tim, why can you do that in practice? So a second quicker in the race than he went in qualifying. But again, qualifying may not have been quite as clean, maybe, as uh, as the race was. Well, there you go, Masters Endurance legends bringing a little bit of the centenary Le Mans spirit to Silverstone. Steve Brooks and Stuart Wiltshire, the Peugeot 1-2 split 
by Tim and Narendra de Silva's Pescaro. So an all French constructors podium. There you go. Uh, Red five, the Zytec of Keith Frieser. Fourth ahead of the Lola Aston, the Christoph Danzenburg and the Morgan Pescarola that's driven by Cummings and Ellis. The BR01 ahead of the HBD Honda and Sean Lynn's second BR01. Uh, just two spots behind at Max Lynn and rounding out the top 10, the Delara of Gregor Fiskin and Sam Hancock, who was shoehorned in, presumably with a fairly large tub of uh, lubricant. Michael Burks, Rob Hall, Bradley Smith, John Minshaw, good close battle between them. The Riley and Scott of Xavier Michon in the top 20. And here are the rest of your runners and riders. The Nissan Jade of Howard Spooner, I think. I oh, know, maybe the McInerney's Moser as well, and Colin Sotis Ferrari. So there's a few more finishers. Uh, the Jade Nissan, though, may well be the first time I've seen that car racing. It's a quite unusual device. So in bright sunshine, not for six hours or a thousand kilometers, but for 40 minutes and 21 laps. The uh, Le Mans field unleashed in the Masters legends. Harinda de Silva doing great stuff from pole position to hold off Steve Brooks in the turbo diesel Peugeot. That's the cars that won Le Mans showing their pace. Early on though, they were challenged and then passed by Jonathan Kennard and heading into the pit stop window, Kennard's Acura looked like it might have the legs to win the race, but it came to a juddering halt before they had had their driver change. And that left Tim De Silva and the two Burgos to battle for the podium. He kept his nose ahead of Stuart Wiltshire, closed down leader Steve Brooks, but in the end, it was a Peugeot 1-3 with the Pescarolo in the middle and all French podium for our Le Mans celebration.